This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. Hey everybody, as promised, I'm back and we're going to be doing February campaigns. We've already done some before, so at the end of this video, you'll see um, the end screen. They'll have a bunch of little boxes. You can watch the previous episodes there and click on them. Try to make it easy for you. If you like to uh, share and subscribe, help some folks out that would also like to uh, have this information, that would be cool too. Everyone who subscribes, likes, and all that kind of stuff helps the channel grow, and that part is very helpful. Uh, helpful to you might be uh, the fact that you can go to the description and click on the links with the time in it, and you can jump to whatever campaign you like. If you think one is not too uh, exciting, you want to go to the next one, I put that in there for you. You can also go directly to the links and uh, see the campaigns for yourself if any of them intrigue you. And uh, that's a service I don't think anyone else offers, and they also don't uh, compile everything for you the way that you're going to get here. So with that in mind, I hope you enjoy it. And for the first next couple of days, we have we only have room for this is a game about being left uh, off the ship when the apocalypse is happening. You want to be the one that gets on the ship. That's basically how it breaks down. You uh, have a bunch of different scenarios. You have one person who makes decision as the captain of who gets on the boat. You have a bunch of other questions that you ask, and you do whatever hilarious things you possibly can with your friends to uh, try to make it. Uh, this is probably not going to make it to funding, but it might make it again in the future. Uh, I very much think that this is going to come back around a couple times and uh, try to find its audience. If you want to be one of them, then go ahead and click in there and uh, you can be reminded or follow the, the guy who's making it. And uh, you go to Kickstarter, you hit the follow button on the creator and uh, it'll tell you when it pops up again if you're interested. I might miss it when it comes back around, so that's why I think if there's any of these small projects that uh, don't get funded but you're interested in them, you should go back and uh, follow those creators just so you can uh, be notified again uh, when it comes back around. Art looks cool, looks like a neat little game, and uh, you know it's for the morbid uh, fans out there, the friends that you have, the ones that would uh, have gotten bored with Cards Against Humanity because it was too tame. That's who you're looking for. Then we have one with the question right in front. What is it beyond the monolith? Well, I have struggled to try to get an answer to that for a while. It was supposed to launch last week, and a lot of people are confused with the system of how they're, what they're asking for, what you're supposed to get in the box, all this other stuff. I think I figured it out finally. I'm going to have to break it out into its whole separate video. So after this one comes out with all the things that are going on, then I will try to do a, an ex explanation video tomorrow morning of uh, what Beyond the Monolith is as I understand it. It is a way to take a one versus many game such as um, Conan, uh, the board game, which is what it's using for the most part here, but it's got so many other things from uh, Batman Gotham City Chronicles and Myth Battles and all this other stuff, even Cthulhu Wars and Zombicide and all these other crazy things. It's trying to tie in to the same campaign all at the same time and it becomes this convoluted mess. I am going to do everything I can, like I said, to break it down if you're interested in this. It is a w way to take a one versus many game and turn it into a one versus one game or a, um, a game that is like uh, Conan that requires more than one player and uh, offer a solo mode option, which is attractive to a lot of people, and that's why I'm interested in it. But uh, like I said, I'll try to break it down to make it easier for you. Then we have another campaign that's trying to trick you a little bit, and this is School of Sorcery. It may remind you of a certain boy wizard and the school he goes to, but for copyright reasons, that's not what this is. It is by Dr. Finn's Game, and uh, they specialize in making little tiny games that are quick to play. They don't cost a lot of money. It's basically Game Crafter components. And, uh, you know, they send it to you pretty quickly. Uh, he's got a lot of different games uh, available, and they are also available in this uh, Kickstarter. So if you are a fan of tiny games that have pretty good artwork, they're not uh, anything that a million dollar campaign is going to put out there. But it's good enough uh, to make it work. And, uh, you know, it's for ages 14 up, as it says there. But maybe uh, maybe some of these will be okay for a younger audience. You just have to uh, be a good parent and know your kid very well and uh, go from there. But uh, that's School of Sorcery, and you can pick up any of the other space games and other cool stuff that uh, Dr. Finn's come out with at the same time. Then we have a map pack. This is for a sci-fi underground base. Uh, they call it House Overland. I have no idea what game that's for, but I'm sure you can use this for just about any sci-fi map. It's uh, It's got uh, top levels, subterranean levels. I'm sure it's for a post-apocalypse type world, and uh, it's 
done in scale. Uh, I think 28 millimeter scale would be a, a good guess for that. Uh, maps are fun to have, especially if you have miniatures ready to go and you want something else. If you don't have terrain uh, or you don't have room for terrain, then uh, a map can be very helpful and you can kind of just fake it with the, uh, the stuff that's there. So uh, yeah, if you need something that's uh, fairly well designed to uh, mix things up more than what you got in the book, uh, Starfinder or whatever, then uh, you take a look at what uh, Ryan Wolf is putting out. He's got a bunch of different uh, options available, not just this one, he's made a few others. Then we have a way to let you fight the Crusades in an hour. How's that sound? Crusader Kingdom's War for the Holy Land is similar to a war game in the way that the map is uh, set up, but it has uh, regular board game tactics and other stuff in it. Um, not really using realistic, uh, 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 I don't want to say realistic components. I'm trying to say realistic armies. Um, they have their own specialties and uh, the art looks pretty good. It fits in the theme and the time frame and all that. So uh, if you're looking for something in this uh, range and uh, you want to fight uh, Saladin or you want to fight as Saladin, it comes with uh, for, uh, one to four players, co-op modes, competitive modes, solo modes, all that kind of cool stuff. Uh, lots of different options available if uh, this is something you're looking for. Then we have a what is best described as a space version of Ticket to Ride, something very similar. Um, but the uh, proceeds in the future are apparently going to be going to build schools and libraries. So that's pretty cool. I'm not sure how much or how uh, the split's going to work out. These are game crafter components for the most part. So it should ship pretty quickly. Um, a small campaign. And if it goes to charity, that'd be cool. If it did go to charity at the end of the, the deal, you can ask them about uh, if uh, your contribution is in some way tax deductible. That might be something you're thinking about um, for next year. Why not? Uh, give it a go. Uh, take a quick look. Uh, Ticket to Ride is one of those really fun games that I don't like doing the scoring part of it. I like having playing it on the computer so the computer can do the scoring and get the rules right. But uh, it's a lot of fun, and I don't think it would be a problem if uh, a space version of that existed. Then we have another small campaign, this time a card game that is also very far away from its funding goal. And uh, we'll probably come back around a little later. It does sound interesting in the sense that it is a party game very similar to uh, Cards Against Humanity in the way that it is constructed. However, it includes more like a charades uh, type of deal. You are given a prompt and you have to get somebody to say the prompt on your team uh, without doing uh, certain things. So there's uh, ways, there's bites, and then there's... Uh, tongues. So the tongue is, you see there, Jimmy Fallon, Shark Tank, Wedding Night, whatever. And then the bites are, you can't talk, or uh, you can't use, uh, you have to use all words with one letter that start with a letter, or that don't start with a letter, or whatever the case is. Um, so it's it's a, it's a bit like you have a constraint, similar to what charades would have, uh, but you are given some type of prompt on a two-card system, like cards against humanity would have. It's going to take a little while to get uh, people in on it. They have a pretty high goal. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it doesn't seem like it would be unfun. It looks like it could be a neat deal. It just depends on what all is included in those, uh, tongue cards and if everybody knows what they are. Then we have a new RPG setting for the Gumshoe RPG. This is, uh, called Casting the Runes, and it is about the world of M.R. James, who wrote a bunch of ghost stories in around the same time as H.P. Lovecraft, Robert E. Howard, and all those guys were doing it. Uh, in the 30s is when he passed away. So uh, you can kind of figure out when it fits in there. He liked, uh, he was called Antiqu the, a person who wrote antiquarian ghost stories, according to Wikipedia. Um, yeah, it just seems like a neat world. Gumshoe, from the look of it, looks to be a pretty good system for creating investigators and investigations. Uh, especially if you're going to have something that's uh, wacky, paranormal, whatever. It's been used for vampires and other stuff before. So, uh, yeah, maybe something that 5e is not appropriate for, even Pathfinder or Call of Thulu, uh, may, less combat-oriented, more investigation-oriented. Uh, it could be a fun game. Take a, take a look and see if you want more of that gothic ghost story kind of world. Then we have a set of miniatures. This is Children of Ferrum Sky, Child Miniatures for Broken Contract. Uh, this can be used for any sci-fi world. It looks like they're coming out of a prison with the uh, same orange pants, uh, but the other graphic, it just looks like they're dirty kids. Maybe it's a crazy version of Logan's Run. Um, I don't know. Uh, the dog there seems to have some type of bionic uh, leg, <laughs> a halfway bionic leg. 
uh, made out of a, uh, I don't know, a golf club. Uh, whatever the case is, semi-modern, close to modern. Uh, and if you needed someone uh, who was younger, not necessarily a uh, soldier, or that type of thing, you wanted somebody who uh, would uh, otherwise populate the world with stuff you didn't have. These guys are 28 millimeter scale, 20 to 32 millimeter scale, and uh, it'll work for you if uh, this is what you're looking for. And if you were looking for some type of investigation for 5e, then uh, that's what this mystery one-shot adventure is for. It says it's inspired by H.P. Lovecraft, which means it has nothing to do with H.P. Lovecraft. It's called What Happened to Evie Ashwood, and uh, it comes with, if you want, it can come with dice and uh, hardcover and all that kind of stuff. Otherwise, it's PDF. Uh, cats and murder and all kinds of ghouly ghosties and possibly some cosmic horror, who knows, uh, could all be in here. If you're looking for a new one shot, then, uh, you couldn't, you could do a lot worse, um, than, uh, jumping in on this, uh, especially since it will come with, uh, some themed dice, the green ones, uh, if that's your, your choice. And it seems to be well illustrated and, uh, set up in the same, uh, fashion as a regular D&D &D book, probably in accordance with the SRD. So, uh, yeah, if you want a mystery and you want to take your uh, group on something that's maybe a little less combat specific and uh, more about uncovering clues, give this guy a shot. You, I'm sure you can take a look at uh, a PDF version or early version if you go to the, the campaign page. You'll be able to ask them some questions and see if this is uh, completely in your wheelhouse. Then if you want something a little bit more like Zombicide from a good developer, this is Neomorphosis Infestation by Dark Gate Games. Uh, they created um, the Order of the Vampire Hunters and uh, what else did they do? No, uh, it hasn't arrived yet. Malleus Maleficarum. I ordered both of those. I'm probably going to skip out on this because I still haven't had a chance to play Zombicide Invader. If you skipped on Zombicide Invader, you want something a little bit smaller, you don't want as many minis, yeah, you want a cheaper game or whatever the case is, or you just want more space games. I have so many of them right now, it's ridiculous. Or uh, you want the uh, Ella Ridley figure there, which uh, looks like Sigourney Weaver from Alien 1, whereas a lot of the other uh, ones that have come out don't necessarily have the full hair like she had there. Uh, Pandemonium did, so I don't need that figure because I have it with Pandemonium. Uh, but yeah, there's there's a lot of cool options uh, there. The minis do look great. You can see them all painted up there. Otherwise, yours will be arriving in gray. And it just looks like it would be a fun game for people that uh, don't want to think too much <laughs> and uh, just want to kill some uh, aliens and stuff. So yeah, take a look at Neomorphosis and uh, support Dark Ape Games uh, if that's in, in your interests. Um, otherwise, you could definitely uh, do worse than... Uh, Order of the Vampire Hunters, which they came out previously. And then there's a game you guys are probably going to have to tell me about because I'm not into anime. Uh, and this is the Dragon Ball Z miniatures game. It comes painted, so you don't have to worry about that if that's what you're into. And apparently, it doesn't really work uh, like a map. It's two fighters going against each other, but um, you seem to be just in a small arena and you put out cards and you go back and forth. I don't know if that's what the... Uh, the anime is like, or if that's something that uh, you would like to, to play. Uh, for me, it's not that interesting. I think a lot of people are going to pick it up just to get the, the painted figures because then they can put it on their shelf or whatever the case is. Um, there's there's options for everybody. Take a look and see if it's your type of game. For me, I have no point of uh, reference to understand what would be going on there. So uh, yeah, I, I think it'd be more in, in, in line for somebody else to pick up. Then we have a two-player card game called the Erloff that I don't quite understand what's going on. It says it's a two-person trick-taking card game with closed bidding and a twist. So I put out there what uh, the flow of the game is. You're dealt a certain number of cards, and uh, you set some other card as a high-scoring one. And then you make predictions to see what you're going to get. I don't know if you get to look at your hand or how that part works. Uh, if you do get to look at your hand, then maybe you get to... Um, assign probabilities in your head as to what's going to be popping out or what the other player is going to play. And that's where you do the battle for tricks. If that's the case for two players, it sounds like they could, uh, you know, play quite a bit and get pretty good at uh, attacking each other with this. Uh, but it isn't expandable, is not expandable beyond two players. So you just have to find two people that like to, to play card games a lot. 
and don't mind the prediction factor. Uh, if, because of the prediction factor, I think there's going to be a bit of a steep learning curve as you learn what the cards do and how many of each there are in the deck. And then I have a tendency to put uh, 3D printed stuff in here so that you can get it if you uh, have a 3D printer. This is a specific component for the 3D printer itself. This is the Anana Stepper 3.0. This is instead of 1 16th micro step, as you can see, 1 28th micro step, which means that it can handle more intensive instructions and come out with a finer result. As you can see on the figure, um, the layer lines have gone away a little bit. Uh, and when it came down to the uh, CNC, they were able to make a more refined image. So it's up to you if this is something that you need. I don't know what uh, controllers you have in your uh, system that you've got in your 3D printer, but it does come with uh, integrated circuits. I don't know if there's going to be clearance issues also. Uh, you're going to have to ask them about your specific printer. I do think you're going to have to make some changes in your slicer uh, in order to uh, get all the benefits out of it. But if you're into 3D printing pretty heavily, then uh, this could be something that you've been looking for for a while. Not just 3D printing, but also laser engraving, or like I said, CNC engraving. Uh, this could be something uh, really amazing for a hobbyist to get uh, incredible results out of. Then we have a repackaging of the Apex game. This is about uh, predators, dinosaurs specifically, but there's a lot of different options available. There is a freaking... Uh, T-Rex right there, a zombie T-Rex coming at you, the stomping dead. Come on, you gotta love that. Uh, basically, they're throwing everything into one box so you can pick it all up at one time when it was available as individual decks before. So uh, lots of different players are available. You can have your favorite dinosaur, you have your favorite uh, land, sea, or air creature, whatever it is, and then you make them fight. And that's what's important, right? Having them fight. So uh, take a quick look and see if this uh, competitive card game is something that you would be interested in or your friends might be interested in. Uh, I've got a lot of sciencey friends. They might be uh, down for this. Uh, I've got some that are specifically interested in paleontology and biology. You know, it'd be great to play with them. Speaking of interesting zoology, I found out today that there is a type of octopus that is immune to the stings of a Portuguese man o' war jellyfish and it'll pull the, uh, the tentacles out or, uh, you know, uh, grab them and use them against other opponents to sting them with. That's amazing. It's like them having a superpower. You know where else they get a superpower? In capers. You get uh, super-powered RPG with moonshiners and mafia and uh, all that kind of cool stuff from Prohibition era. If this is uh, the type of era that you want to play in, lots of cool things were going on. Uh, you know, before cell phones ruin everything in <laughs> your plots, uh, in, uh, you just want something where, you know, it's pretty understandable who the good guys and bad guys are. Uh, it's the ones breaking the law or the ones, you know, following the law. And, uh, you have low technology where all these superpowers, um, can really shine. So yeah, take a look at Capers RPG and, uh, see if any of this stuff will work for you. These guys are in Marietta, Georgia. I don't know if it has anything to do with, uh, the other big company, Simon, that's in Marietta, Georgia, but so far it doesn't look like that. Uh, but you know, maybe they, uh, they worked, uh, has some similar art and whatever. Then we have a game of coasters cause that's what your dungeon is created with using coasters. I don't know if you get to set your drink on them, but otherwise that's the shape and size of them. Uh, all these lovely people seem to be having a great time, uh, flipping over tiles and moving through, uh, looking for a monster, a treasure and, uh, disarming whatever traps and things that happen in there. They, uh, fulfill the chance part of this by flipping and bouncing coins uh, in order to hit things, disarm things, whatever, uh, make that, those decisions. So it's not like you're, uh, you're rolling a die to get a number result. You're, uh, bouncing a coin on the table to get some other type of result. So you're going to lose a few of them. And, uh, you know, if it's in a bar like this or a dark area, they may go flying and you might never ever recover them. Uh, if you could buy something that has a little bit of glow in the dark to uh, add to it, like a glow in the dark um, a paint, whatever, you put that on a quarter. But uh, you use a UV light, or like a little UV flashlight or something at a bar, you might find scary things under the table. And we discussed earlier what 3D printing was all about and that motor might help you make these Empire of Scorching Sands 3D printable tabletop models. 
Uh, this is obviously a Middle Eastern theme from uh, Thousand and One Nights era, and we have Ifrits, you have gin, you have carpets, you have tents, cushions and pillows, and all kinds of neat things that uh, will fit that same theme. If uh, you're using that in D&D, if you're using that in some other campaign, then uh, or you just like having a diorama of these type of uh, deals, the models look pretty cool. Uh, if you have a resin printer, I think they'll be very helpful in a lot of this. Um, an FDM printer, if it got the same resolution as those Anana steppers are saying it'll get, uh, would do really, really well um, doing these things if it was just regular FDM, like I said. Uh, but that's up to you. If you, uh, I don't recommend doing the bigger pieces like the tents and all that in the, the resin. Uh, it's just uh, you have to buy a bigger, more expensive uh, unit with a bigger build plate in order to make that happen. Uh, it's much more, uh, much more manageable in uh, the cost with an FDM printer. But that's up to you how you feel about layer lines. And then we have a new RPG. I'm going to tell you straight off the bat. Uh, I tried listening to the video and the voice is so annoying it sounds fake. I'm not really sure what they're trying to say or go with or whatever the case is. Uh, it's made close to $50,000 well past its goal. Uh, that's a big number for a new RPG. Basically they're going off the reputation of Nobilis, which was a previous work. Uh, and that's what Glitch is, a new extension of whatever this person's RPGs are. They've been out of print for quite a while. I hope that's an indicator of quality, uh, but that's all I can give you. Glitch, the video doesn't really say much, so you're going to have to go to the other ones. Uh, like I said, I just couldn't take the voice of the actor uh, or whoever the person was. It just did not sound like they're... There's too many weird inflections at the end of every sentence and everything. I don't know what the heck was going on. Um, but uh, if they do have some bona fides, if they do have a well-written uh, product, I don't want to uh, put that away from you just because I have a pet peeve when people do uh, put upon vocal inflections like that. And man, we're catching all the things I know nothing about. This one's about golf. Duffers. It's a card game about golf. Um, yeah, it's not mini golf. They're putting it in the clown's head. I'd be all over it, but uh, now this is about regular golf, which uh, I never play. So uh, I'm all for running around on a on a grassy field, but you know maybe it's throwing a ball for a dog or something. But uh, if you can't get out to uh, play because it's in the winter time or whatever the case is, and uh, you're not in an area that uh, has all your grass, um, instead it's covered in snow, then maybe you can get this for your dad, your grandfather, or whatever. And, uh, I don't know, grandmother, maybe, you know, Tiger Woods, I, you know, what, I'm not gonna say who you do or don't know, uh, and, uh, play with them and, uh, give them a good time when they can't get out to the links. Then we have a different type of sport and this is dungeon ball, which is like a football game. So they say it should be compared with blood bowl and King of Tokyo mixed together. I haven't played King of Tokyo. I've seen a little bit what blood bowl is, uh, I'm fine with that. Uh, it has some pretty neat uh, artwork already in place. We did a bit for Blood Bowl, like an orc-themed stadium uh, review a little while ago. I think it's still out there on the market uh, that you could 3D print out. This would be perfect for that if that's uh, something that you're into. Um, but Blood Bowl does exist, so I would say take a look at this <clears throat> and take a look at that and... Uh, if you want something that's a little more expansive, has a little more options, then Blood Bowl might be for you. Uh, if you want something that's new and different and not like Blood Bowl, then Dungeon Ball may be for you. Um, so just keep those two in mind uh, as you look through the two options, if any of them seem like they'd be fun games. Then we've got some open lock tiles, uh, sci-fi stuff. The same creator has come out with these tiles before, I believe. Very similar tiles. Um, this is a different type of station. You can put it together. Open lock is supposed to be completely modular, uh, basically the same size for all the different components, but there's just so many different components available. One of the things though you wanna keep track of when you are 3D printing is that shrinkage is an issue depending on the PLA that you use. So uh, buying these types of systems from people, at least in theory, they should have accommodated for uh, the warpage that's gonna occur, occur from cooling and then you'll still be able to slide them in and out as necessary. But I only bring this up because your mileage may vary depending on your machine, resin, or 
uh, FDM, that part is up to you. The shapes seem pretty easy to go by, um, but obviously you wouldn't get uh, these colors if you're printing it yourself. You're going to have to make it in a, such a way and have your uh, machine calibrated in such a way that uh, you'd be able to paint easily over top of it, in which case I would suggest resin. Then we have Building Cities, which seems a lot like an early version of SimCity. Um, you have different, uh, like there's a Statue of Liberty, you have different types of iconic towers and things you can throw in there and score. Different amounts based on the, uh, the world that you create, basically. This is for one to four players. Everybody gets uh, an opportunity. I don't think that this is going to fund on its first round in. Uh, maybe with a few more tweaks uh, coming through, but uh, that doesn't mean that it won't be fun eventually and it'll find its audience. So as I keep suggesting on these ones that aren't going to fund on their initial uh, round of, uh, you know, trying to get an audience, follow the creator and then you'll be able to uh, catch up on whatever changes they're going to make and uh, whenever they're going to relaunch, you'll be notified. Then we have one of the more interesting projects, not just because the black and white artwork is pretty cool. This is the Forgotten Rites of the Moldering Dead. This is ways to create funerals for your RPG projects. It doesn't really matter which RPG you're going to use. It's compatible, it says, with the uh, old school dungeon, the, the DCC RPG, so the dungeon crawl uh, part. But I don't think it's going to matter which one you, you use. Um, there's a lot of different types of cultures out there, uh, mystery religions, the uh, pagan stuff, whatever. Uh, it would be interesting to uh, incorporate those in uh, new and fascinating ways, depending on uh, where uh, they live. If it's uh, cold climate, hot climate, whatever it is that they do with the dead, um, they can do mummification like the Aztecs did. Uh, and the Aztecs were living in an arid area so that they were able to mummify uh, just by leaving it out there. Uh, Mayans, too. Out, the people out there in Peru had their mummies. They just put them in a cave and waited, and they became mummified. The Egyptians had to salt them up because they had a different type of climate. So, uh, yeah, all these different fascinating ideas uh, thrown together in different ways. Uh, I think it's a, it's a neat book for not a lot of money uh, and can uh, expand your imagination quite a bit and the worlds that you generate. Then we have something that talks about uh, part of the fantasy world that's rarely brought up. How do they poop? This is the Game room, game Room's Throne board game. And it's about plumbers trying to unclog a toilet in a dice tower tavern after a half-ogre went in and tore the place up. So, there you go. You have uh, a clog tracker... And you have a bunch of different types of uh, fantasy-themed plumbers. None of them are named Mario, as far as I'm aware. But you can change that if you want. And, uh, yeah, you get the business done. It's funny. It's cheap. And, uh, I don't know, it could be neat. Depends on uh, if you have uh, some uh, folks that can understand the humor as you play through. Or you have the humor and you want to play it uh, solo. Uh, I don't think you can play it on the can. But it would be amazing if you could. Uh, maybe you could make uh, some uh, stickers or suction cups or something to, to make that work so you can, you know, fulfill the theme in all of its glory. Then we have some more sci-fi types of miniatures for you. These are the Starfolk by Ilgotten Games. Ilgotten Games have come out with a bunch of other uh, of these miniature styles before. There's a lot more than just what I've shown here on the page. You can check it all out. Um... Yeah, uh, Fat Jar Jar to uh, other things that maybe were in the Mos Eisley Cantina to uh, Astronaut Shock Troopers, uh, Space Dwarves, whatever it is that you're looking for. Take a quick look and see if uh, Ill-Gotten Games has it for you. This is their Star Folk line. Then we have a different type of RPG. This is the Endless Realm Fungi Fight for Freedom. And the system it uses is the Endless Realms D10 system. I haven't heard of that one before, so it's great that they're coming out with something that uh, fits in that world. The art looks pretty neat. Um, I don't know it's it, what a level 7 to 8 adventurer is in this uh, context, uh, but it says that the type is horror, investigation, mystery, and escape. 
Horror could make some sense because fungi eat the dead. Um, investigation, mystery, okay, I'm all in. I'm all in for what that is. Uh, the artwork there for uh, the uh, the races doesn't necessarily make me think that mystery and escape is an investigation or the way to go. It seems more combat oriented, but uh, yeah, give it a, a, a take a look anyway. I mean, maybe you'll be inspired for uh, your own underdark adventures. But they do look like pretty cool fungi. Then we have wooden dice. We see a lot of metal ones. We don't see a lot of wood ones. Uh, I don't know on your screen how well you can see it, but um, we have stags, wolves, lions, and crows. And if that doesn't make you think of certain houses and certain television shows or uh, other types of games, then you're not paying enough attention. Um, that being the case, they look beautiful. Uh, obviously, the 20 would be the one with the sigil. And we can't say or shouldn't say to get these guys in trouble uh, what they might represent out loud. But you would just give it a wink and a nod and you'd know where they, you know, what uh, <clears throat> icy, fiery, possible throny thing it might fit in, right? Then we have another sport I never got into and that's cycling. <laughs> but uh, I don't understand what visions of rainbows means. I understand what uh, a race part, though, is. You are cycling in a race, and the board is very customizable, so you can change terrain and uh, other options as you use the cards to power your racers through. That part sounds pretty uh, neat and interesting, especially if you're going to play with other folks on a rainy day or in some other type of weather that you wouldn't otherwise be able to cycle through. Maybe you have someone in the family who's really into watching, I don't know, Lance Armstrong? I, I don't know. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of options available. Uh, this is the type of sport that I only pay attention to during the Olympics and only if America gets a gold, right? But you could be different. But here's something I could get into. Let's rob the Vatican. Why not? Let's make it happen in Habiemus. Habiemus? Habiemus. Habiemus. Whatever the thing is, two to four players get to compete to... Uh, Rob the rich and give to yourself. I like that as far as uh, gaming goes. It's not a philosophy for life, but in gaming, it can make things a lot more interesting. Uh, can you tell that I'd like to play the Rogue at some point if I can get a D&D game going? I, I really would. Always Thief. Every time. Backstab, backstab, backstab. Anyway, uh, that's what this is about. It's uh, probably not going to fund another one of those. But... I think uh, it maybe on the next round it'll it'll uh, find its audience. Um, the artwork is it's okay, not great. It's okay. The portrait stuff looks all right. Uh, the other stuff looks a little, just a little too much like a sketch as opposed to finalized art. Um, but the backs of the cards and all that look pretty cool. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, I th think there should be uh, a few more examples of just uh, how to be cutthroat and uh, you know make it more fun. The um, church theme I think might be holding it back. Here we go, the type of golf I can understand. Mini golf designer, board game. Um, yeah, you make some, you take the tiles and you make some wacky uh, types of uh, golf games. It's a competitive free-form puzzle of mini golf courses as it describes. It's fairly cheap um, and you know it doesn't necessarily require anything uh, uh, great as far as uh, table space or anything like that and uh it doesn't uh it's not golf it's mini golf so you can uh, make it a bunch of wacky little puzzles and uh as big or as small as you want so i find that a little more interesting and then we have the shifting realms darkness revealed expansion for soaring rhino um very quick game of a bunch of different tiles and tile layouts that allow you to have a fantasy battle in about 60 minutes. So that's relatively quick for uh, what you would normally get uh, for this type of game. It could be, you know, three, four hours, you don't even know. Um, but uh, very simplistic in the artwork, uh, not necessarily going to be for everyone, especially when you compare it to other options that are out there. But in a sense, I think the simple artwork actually works to the benefit of this game. Uh, because the modularity is so high. Take a quick look and see if this is something for you. I would guess, though, if you've played other Soaring Rhino games before, this is a no-brainer. And finally, for this episode, I'm throwing in the dwarves. These are 
a bunch of keg holding, beer drinking, little tiny guys for whatever you want to use them for. Um, sometimes, you know, the dwarves have the biggest personalities, even though they don't have the biggest stature. And uh, that makes them a lot of fun to have around. And you like having a lot of different options for them. If you've got uh, an underdark adventure or you're just going through various holds or you just want to spice up the, you know, the world a little bit with little guys, dwarves by Lance Wilkinson. There's a lot of different options. Take a look at his campaign. All right. So I'm going to cut off this episode there and then uh, we'll be back at, on the weekend and uh, throw more stuff at you through February, whatever else is coming out. Like I said, I'm going to try to put another bonus episode tomorrow together to try to explain Beyond the Monolith because it sorely needs it. It needs it so bad. If you want to help out the channel, feel free to like, share, subscribe, share it with whoever you think would uh, enjoy this channel. And, uh, you know, otherwise you guys have a, a fantastic week. Thanks for all the get well wishes and whatnot uh, from before. And uh, I hope you guys have a wonderful one.